Okay, and here we have um, two presenters, uh, right? I both uh, presenting. Uh, that's my assumption. Okay, we have uh, uh, Kat Alexander, is a fellow of ACI and is a professor of practice in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alberta. He is also a structural engineering specialist for uh, uh, COWI North America at their uh, Edmonton office. Kat is an associate member of the joint ACI AC Committee 421 design of reinforced concrete slabs and uh, 445 shear and torsion, as well as joint SEI ACE subcommittee 445C shear and torsion punching shear. His, uh, uh, his research interests include structural applications of high performance concrete, bridge rehabilitation, and punching shear. We also have uh, uh, Eva Langsat. Uh, who's the full professor at uh, the University of San Francisco and an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in Delft in the Netherlands. She's the vice chair of SEI 445E Torsion and a member of SEI 445 uh, uh, DOD. Uh, she a database, SEI 421. Uh, design of reinforced concrete slabs and SEI 342, evaluation of concrete bridges and bridge elements, and an associate member of SEI 437, strength evaluation of existing concrete structures, and SEI AC 445, Shia and Torsion. So, welcome uh, to both Scott and Eva. So, you can go ahead and start. Thank you very much, Mustafa. I'll, that's, a, that's an excellent start. Um, application of strip model to edge column slab connections with outward eccentricity. So there's a few things I'd like to define here. So we start off with, uh, we need to define eccentricity. So we're going to keep everything pretty simple here. Eccentricity is going to be a ratio of a moment to uh, a shear that's transferred to the column. That moment is going to be relative to the centroid of the column. So this is the kind of stuff you would need to know if you were designing the column. Not usually what we use uh, in the traditional approach to shear and moment transfer, because we usually talk about um, centroids of critical sections, but we're not going to be using that here. Um, there are a couple of uh, ways of looking at eccentricity, and, and the one that we're going to talk about inward and outward eccentricity. So an inward eccentricity is one that is relative to the centroid of the column. Uh, the eccentricity of load is to the inside of the building. And uh, so obviously an outward eccentricity is pointing outside of the building. You'll find that there's an awful lot of test results for inward eccentricities, but there really aren't a lot of results, especially not results with good boundary conditions, for outward eccentricities. Which brings me to some tests done by uh, Dr. Nevea Albuquerque um, for her PhD. This, uh, this was reported in the, uh, the structural journal, ACI Structural Journal in 2016, September, October. And they did some very, very elegant little tests where they could control the eccentricity by, uh, they basically created a simply supported beam, a uh, fairly wide beam, uh, but a column support on one end with a controlled eccentricity, uh, a reasonable modeling of distributed load, and you get realistic sort of moment fields in the vicinity of the column. A couple of things that are going to be really important about, about this, or maybe just one thing I want to emphasize, is, is that um, all the reinforcement perpendicular to the free edge uh, of the slab. The free edge of the slab would be the one, the, the edge with the column on it. The, the other ones technically are interior, interior faces. Um, that free edge, the steel perpendicular to the free edge, all the bars had 180 degree hooks, and that includes the bottom steel. And that is not a typical detail, I don't think, but it is, it is one that uh, is, is relevant to an analysis of this. Now the method that I'm going to be using is a strip model, and a strip model uh, is is really a, a an exercise in describing viable load paths. So it's it's not really uh, 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 we're not trying to describe a failure mechanism. 
Uh, and that makes it quite different than the usual approaches that we've got for design of slab column connections, where we try to find various things that are critical. Um, always in, in, this, in this approach, though, the equations of equilibrium are paramount. So what we have is the notion of an arch strip. And the arch strip, uh, I've got a couple illustrated here on the left. Uh, one of them is an interior strip, and it gets loaded on, on both, both sides. So the, the little yellow strip is the arch strip, and we've got arching action in there, taking a shear into the column, and it's loaded on its side faces. Uh, at an edge column, though, we could also have spandrel strips. They're running along the free edge of the slab, and they get loaded on one face. So uh, they all get the same equation of equilibrium. They all have the potential for a negative moment at the column end or the support end, a positive moment at the uh, remote end, uh, and uh, they could have loading from both sides. So if they're loaded from one side only, then this chi times L sub S, uh, chi ends up being zero. And if they're loaded from both sides, chi takes a value of one. Uh, and you can sort of imagine all, all sorts of cases in between. But we end up with an equation of equilibrium, and this I've been chastised before, this is, this is just an equation for an arch, and that's exactly correct. It's just equilibrium of an arch. It's no more. M sub S itself is the sum of the MS neg and MS positive, uh, and they're both shown in, in what I would say are their positive senses there. So uh, in, in, that, in that figure, they have the same um, sense uh, rotationally. It's also possible to get arching action in two, two ways, two two directions at the same time. Uh, and uh, that's, that's all we're illustrating here. Uh, the equation doesn't change. What does change maybe is how much load you're going to put into M sub S or how much moment you're going to put into that. Uh, but apart from that, the concept doesn't change. And uh, I should also have mentioned the loading term Q sub C. Uh, it doesn't change. Now, for the moments on a free edge, one of the things we have to be very careful of, and this is really independent, this has nothing to do with the strip model, this is something we should be looking at in the ACI code, is, is the development of reinforcement perpendicular to the free edge. In doing this work, we've made an accounting of how much uh, steel between the, uh, the width B, C2 plus one and a half H on either side, how much of that is really anchored? Uh, because uh, the effectiveness of bars diminishes quite quickly as you move away from the column. So an accounting has been made of that. The final thing is, what's this Q sub C business? Well, it's just a one-way shear. Uh, we've included the, I've included the, uh, the uh, scale effect. Haven't included uh, uh, ACI's effect for reinforcing ratio. It happens on these particular tests that it wouldn't have made much difference. It would have come out to about a factor of one anyway. Um, but the, uh, and the scale effect, uh, the slabs are shallower than 10 inches, so it's not doing anything either. Uh, it turns out that if accounting for reinforcing ratio in the one-way shear would be overkill because we're going to explicitly look at shear reinforcement, or uh, sorry, uh, flexural reinforcement anyway. So what we have is a couple or three different possibilities. If we start over on the right-hand side, we've got uh, an interior strip, a uh, one-way strip that can feed in. And the little blue line there is all of the combinations of shear and moment, given the layout of, of reinforcement that's in the Albuquerque tests, uh, all the combinations of shear and moment that we can explain uh, with that. Uh, the, on the left-hand side, we have another one-way uh, system or one-way arching system, and that is uh, uh, the spandrel strips. And with that configuration, we can explain everything that's shown in the red lines. And then the last little bit is, uh, requires two-way ar arching, uh, and that's the, the points between D or AC to D, our two-way arching. And rather than work on a big interaction, we're just going to calculate the point C and, and, and it may basically play connect the dots. And I think at this point, I would like to invite my co-author, Ava Lansot, to take over. Thank you. Um, 
So let's now look at how this capacity envelope compares to the experimental results of these experiments of Albuquerque that we introduced um, previously. So we are going to start first with um, six experiments, the first six experiments that you see here as the data points L1 through L6, since all of these have the same reinforcement layout. Um, you can see here the capacity envelope of the strip model in green, that's the green line. And the blue line that you see plotted is the ACI shear interaction for uh, reference with the dashed line on the right hand side that is the flexural limit on moment transfer um, with reinforcement within, um, just as Scott just showed, to see the, the column that I mentioned, plus one and a half H on both sides. Now, what is interesting here are, of course, the data points when outward eccentricity, so L3 through L6. And there we can see that the difference um, with the ACI becomes much larger. And then um, the capacity envelope is, is in, in, in close line with the experimental results. Now, a few words on um, the left-hand side of the capacity envelope. So we have a straight part, um, which looks like a plateau, and that part is a function of the positive moment that can be mobilized perpendicular to the free edge. And then the part that slopes downward that follows experiments three and four, that is dictated by the column dimension perpendicular to the free edge. Um, in addition, um, so remember that one of the particularities of the experiments is that the bottom bars were fully hooked. Um, if that would not have been the case, then the capacity diagram would have been closer to that of ACI. And another particularity of these experiments is that if they would have been wider, um, if the width of the, this beam element, slab beam, would have been wider, then we would have been able to develop the full potential of the spandrel arch strips. Um, but right now the capacity is governed by the one-way shear over the width of the specimen. So in the next um, diagram, here we see the enhanced reinforcement cases, uh, so experiments 7, 11, and 12. And these have what we call enhanced reinforcement, which means they had additional uh, bottom steel perpendicular to the free edge. So this extends the plateau, um, but does not increase the shear strength. Um, now, we ha also have a few experiments in which there is shear reinforcement. Um, let's start with the ones that have studs. Now, how do we account for these studs in the strip model? Well, we should uh, acknowledge that, well, first of all, here's the layout of the, of the studs, and we've called them uh, studs layers A through D. And the way they are activated really depends on the load pad. So when we have arching, um, there the studs have negligible effect because there it's the, the concrete arch that carries the load. Um, so um, if you can move to the next, please. So you see that here within the arch, these uh, stud lines, D and C, do not contribute. Now, A and B, they do um, contribute um, within the one-way shear. Uh, ne uh, click next, please. Yes, so here we see how the one-way shear is carried. And uh, again, next, please. We can see then that each of these stud lines uh, contribute with 43.1 kilonewton to the shear capacity. So let's now look how that influences our um, capacity envelopes. And really, we have just one experiment, which is L9. And L9 has zero eccentricity. This one has the uh, what we call the standard reinforcement layout. 
um, so as specimens L1 through L6, um, with a 20% increase in concrete compressive strength and with the studs. So you can see here the effect on of the capacity envelope and the experimental result. We also have um, a case and here we see how the added uh, cap shear capacity um, results on the capacity envelope. And then uh, finally, we also have two experiments where there are ties in the spandrel. These are L8 and L13. Um, in particular, L8 had uh, diameter 8 millimeter ties at 60 millimeter on center, and L13 had diameter 6.3 millimeter ties, also at 60 millimeters on center, which gives us additional moment capacity of 37.7 kilonewton meter and 23.6 kilonewton. Then we will see here how that relates to the capacity envelopes of these experiments. So you see with the lines, um, the lighter green one for L8 and the darker green one for L13. Um, so what we see is that these additional hoops, they add to the moment transfer, so they extend the plateau, but they do not um, change the shear capacity. So finally, here we see the results of tested to predicted capacities um, with the strip model, the ACI code, and the Eurocode. Now, we didn't introduce or talk about Eurocode much at all at all. If you look at the original Albuquerque paper, they are or already um, identified that Eurocode is um, very conservative for outward eccentricity. And well, we have the same result here. I just added it here for reference. Um, and then the ACI results, we see uh, experiments L1, L2, and L9. Those are the ones that have no eccentricity or inward eccentricity, where ACI gives a reasonably good prediction. But for the experiments with the outward eccentricity, we get very conservative results, which gives us, which leads to the fact that we then have an average tested to predicted ratio of roughly 2.2 and a large coefficient of variation. With the strip model, um, we get to an average of roughly 1.1 and a coefficient of variation of 8%, which shows that especially for the outward eccentricity, the model performs uh, better than the existing code methods. So in conclusion, uh, what we've seen today is that the strip model has the flexibility to handle outward eccentricity, that the code predictions are very conservative that moment transfer at the edge is sensitive to the anchorage of reinforcement perpendicular to the free edge that has a uh, large influence on the results. And we also saw that the strip model gives better predictions and insight into the shear moment interaction of a slab column connection. And that would conclude our presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And Scott.